Thanks, Scott. Well, he's right. You got the accountant today. So there's the bottom of the barrel, and then there's the accountant. No. Uh, and one of your suggestions could be don't ever have the accountant talk again. We're going to talk about child tax credits today. <laughs> and if you want to donate that house in Goleta to raffle off, I can show you how to write that off, too. Now, today, uh, my name is John Ludwig. I'm the accountant uh, here. Take care of the books and the finances. Take care of Scott and uh, the rest of the pastors and help them to do their job effectively. I'm married to Sabina, who's back in the corner there, my beautiful wife. I've got four children, two of which are on the climbing wall, Jana and Levi, two of which are seated next to my wife. And Lord willing, they'll be well behaved today, which gives me a little ounce of credibility. Um, we do do things a little bit differently in our family, in a good way, I hope, and I'll explain that as we go along here. Uh, we're a homeschooling family also, so we're crazy. And it's been through this homeschool journey that we've come across so much of the material and the people that have helped us to develop our parenting style. And I'll share a little bit of that today, but uh, the series is called Parenting by the Book, so I hope that there will be an adequate amount of uh, Bible to back up what I'm doing. And you won't feel like, oh, he's way out in left field. Um, as Scott pointed out, thank you, Scott, we're not perfect. We screw up every single day. Amen, Sabina? Oh, pointing at me. <laughs> but, but we really are. We are trying to be intentional with our biblical parenting. We're trying to follow what God's Word says. We're trying to apply it to our, our family and to all the little personalities that make up our family. And so everybody's family is going to be a little bit different, and that's okay. So I want to start, if this works. Uh-oh. There it goes. I want to review what uh, Aaron and Emily did last week because I thought they had an excellent foundation for our study. And the first thing was their relationship, your relationship with God. That's of the primary importance, the foundation of everything that you do as a parent and as a Christian is your relationship with God. And they had a couple points with that. The first one was, he said, uh, know that your Redeemer lives. You know, there is a God in heaven who is watching over you, who is guiding you by his Holy Spirit, and who will reward you for your obedience and will correct you for disobedience. Number two is make sure God is a priority. That's going to translate in your personal walk with God, in your marriage, and then in your children also. The third one, uh, bless is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. He should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. So we're going to rely on that promise. Whatever we do shall prosper if we're following wholeheartedly after the Lord, including our parenting. Then they went on to talk about our relationship with our spouse. Our kids see our relationship, and it reflects on our relationship with God. If we're not treating our spouse right, how can we have a right relationship with God? The, our kids see through that kind of stuff. Men, when you behave like a man of God, he blesses your marriage. And keep up with the intimacy. It's not just how you get the kids, but it also helps you keep them. Right? This is vital to any marriage. And if you miss this, it's on our YouTube channel, and you can go watch it after uh, tonight. And then uh, your relationship with your time was their third point. Keeping God our first priority. That brings physical and spiritual blessings. Emily said, I would be mortified to see my kids succeed, quote unquote, without the Lord. To be successful in the world's eyes and yet to walk away from God would kill Emily as a mother, and I'm sure it would do the same for you as a parent also. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And then their fourth point was your relationship with your money. And I thought that was interesting that Aaron would go there for a parenting study. But he asked us, are we trusting God, uh, are we trusting in the bank statement more than we're trusting in God? We can have everything 
and still lose our family. We see it on the newspapers and the entertainment tabloids all the time. By giving, which is generosity, we are protecting our family because God blesses the generous man and the generous woman. And by doing that, you're bringing blessing into your family. Try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, and pour out, I think I edited it wrong, sorry, and pour out on you such blessing that there will be not room enough to receive it, Malachi 3.10. So the summary verse for them was this one. Emily talked about this at the very end. If there is anyone, if, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. So we could all agree that we want to be blessed. God blesses the obedient man and woman. God blesses the obedient mom and dad. That's where we want to be. When I've got your little preschoolers in my class, right? When I've got Olivia and Jennifer, and I teach them, you know, the wise man builds his house on the rock. Jesus said that's the person who hears God's word and does it. And the foolish man who builds his house on the sand, that was the disobedient or the foolish man that heard God's word and said, eh, I'll do it my way. And then when the storms of life come crashing in on his life, what happens to that house? It goes splat. Okay, we're in a war. Second Corinthians 10.3 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and everything that exalts itself above the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. You've all experienced, those of you who have children, you've all experienced the struggle of kids, right? Parenting is hard work. Parenting can sometimes feel like a battle, a war. And there is somebody out there who's looking to do us harm. That gun should be pointed at somebody in particular, and that's the devil, Satan. He prowls around like a roaring lion, trying to devour people. And he knows that if he can attack our marriages and put them on the rocks, he can, he, if he can have our kids abandon their faith when they finally leave our house, that he's won and he's defeated us. And so, thank God he gives us tools for that. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, Ephesians 6, 12. Pastor Scott knows that just after that quote, he goes on to talk about the armor of God, the things that we can put on in order to help us to defeat that foe. And Families are Satan's prime target, but God has graciously, graciously given us everything that we need to fight that fight. I'll explain why Satan wants to attack families uh, just in a moment. But here's some American stats. So you can't come to a, uh, an accountant talk and not have some statistics. <laughs> Sorry. Satan's been systematically attacking families since the beginning of time, right? He did it with Adam and Eve in the garden, and he continues to do it in your homes today. But we see in the trends and the history that we've seen, a um, lot lot's been happening in the past, let's say, 100 years. In 1960, single-parent homes were 1 in 10. In 2013, the most recent number I could find that was uh, valid, it's now gone to 1 in 3. 33% of our children are growing up with one mom or one dad and nobody else in that home. Teen pregnancies, which are a con contribution to those single parent families. In 1990, which was the peak of the teen pre pregnancy epidemic, we had uh, 1.25 million teens between the ages of 15 and 19 become pregnant in one year. That's 116.8 pregnancies per 1,000 teenage girls. 
more than one in 10. Of those pregnancies, 35% ended in abortion. That's 1990 statistics. I'll do the math for you. That's 437,500 babies. Moving on to 2009, again, the most uh, recent. It's come down. We can't get into all the specifics because we just don't have time, but there's been a whole bunch of work on this problem, and the number has come down. And the percentage of abortions have come down, too, to 25%. So people like Network Medical and those other ministries that are working to stop abortion in the modern world, they're having an effect. But still, if I can do the math for you, that's 175,000 babies in one year. So we've got a problem. And that's, a lot of these teen mothers are unmarried. Now we're talking to ages 15 to 19. You know, some people get married at 19. One of the girls in our Bible college is 19, just got engaged. She'll be married in a couple months. In 1960, 15% of those teen mothers were unmarried. And that means you probably had a lot of 17, 18, 19-year-olds, because we're talking to the entire American spectrum, maybe a little bit younger in the South, a little bit older in the North, but at least they were getting married. And so those children were entering into homes that had a mom and a dad. By 2009, that had jumped to 89%. So now, it starts to make sense why we have such a single parent epidemic. The traditional family is eroding in, in America. And what are we gonna do about it? Well, we start with our families, right? We start with our families. Um, let's see. Traditional families. This is defined as two married parents in their first marriage, okay? No divorce and remarriage, no stepdads, stepmoms, nothing. In 1960, 73% of children grew up in a home that had two parents on their first marriage. By 2013, it was down to 46%. Divorce rates are up, we all know that. People are choosing not to marry when they have children out of wedlock. And this is what we're reaping. So Dr. Mack, Sabina, my wife, by God's grace, got to go to the master's college and work on a master's of arts in biblical counseling. And her first professor, and I think this, you know, I'm going to put him up there with Jay Adams and the rest of the guys that are pioneers in the biblical counseling field, was our instructor for a family and marriage counseling class. And uh, she did the summer institute, so I got to take off work, and I came and sat in on the classes with her. And so he was going through this whole problem as he's laying out his case. So he says, in the last 100 years, here's some challenges. There's been, a, I know this is microscopic, I'll read it out loud, I, I apologize. And the video, there's no way that they can see it at home. There's been a shift from rural to urban living. The majority of fathers work outside the home now, which means that their time with their family is very limited. More mothers with small children are working. I've got a spec for that. In 2013, 70% of mothers with children under the age of 18 work outside the home, which is an exponential increase in the past 100 years. Uh, the popular concepts of roles of the husband and the wife have been changing. When I mean popular, I mean out in the world, right? The biblical roles have not changed for thousands of years. It's the popular concepts. Divorce has become widely accepted. So much so that divorce within the church mirrors that of divorce outside the church. Solving problems by divorce is now a recommended uh, outcome. Nuclear families, that means, come on, there it is. Nuclear families are moving around often. They're not with their extended families anymore. How many of you guys are living near parents and, and partaking in the well, some of you get child care all the time from grandma and grandpa, but we don't. My wife's parents live in Frankfurt, Germany, and mine lived in Baltimore and now moved to Las Vegas. So I've stayed in the same place for as long as I've ever lived anywhere, but my dad has crisscrossed America three times in that, in that length of time. So families are moving. Jobs are taking us all over the place. We can't develop those long-lasting friendships like we used to. 
Judeo-Christian values and moral standards have diminished. In fact, they're mocked and blamed for some of society's problems. Materialism and hedonism are openly promoted. If you want the good life, YOLO, right? Take care of yourself first. This is what's preached. Family size has decreased dramatically. We're going to talk about that a little more. You know, right now in America, we have 2.0 children on average per household. 2.1 is the replacement value, okay? Because uh, not every child lives to get to childbearing age, and some are infertile and whatnot, you need to have 2.1 children in order to keep your community going to the next generation. We're just a bit, little bit under that. Uh, Western European countries are down to 1.6, like in Sweden, 1.7. Uh, the family is stripped of reasons for their existence. We're irrelevant, aren't we? All you have to do is look at TV. You got modern family, these crazy configurations of people living now. And this is being pushed forward in the world as being, this is the new norm. So this is what we're up against. However, God's word gives us the tools that we need to succeed. Because we believe as men and women of faith that if we obey God's word, He'll bless our marriages and our families. And then I've got a good quote from Oswald Chambers. All noble things are difficult. It's hard work digging into the word. It's hard work figuring all this out. It's hard work reading all those parenting books that some of them can be extremely dry. It's hard work sitting through my teaching. It's hard work doing this stuff. But it's noble work, and it'll be work that's rewarded. And that's what we're in it for. We're in it for the long term. We're here to get best, and uh, we're here to be blessed and to glorify God. Now, I want you to just get a little awe and wonder over the formation of the family. Thanks to Dr. Mack, we discovered this amazing little book called The Family and Its Civil and Churchly Aspects. This stuff was written a long time ago, and it reads like poetry. So some of the stuff up here is not original. There's no way that I write like this, okay? <laughs> the first thing, the original uh, family foundations, God's creation of the family, the original society from which the state emerges and the church and every other association known amongst men. Our families are divinely ordained. When God created Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter one, he placed them in the garden. He performed the first marriage ceremony and he gave them the command, be fruitful and multiply. He created the first family right there on day six of creation, or shortly thereafter. And that has been continuing through this whole time. So your families, your marriages are an invention of God. They're not man's, uh, nothing that we've conceived in our own strength. So we learn that the man steps out to become the leader of a new family. Genesis 2.24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. So how do we create a new family? The future husband leaves his family and goes to the side and then the wife joins that man and they become a new family, a new decision-making body, okay? Under its own jurisdiction, that man becomes the leader. He's not under subjection to anyone but God at that time. Well, of course, there's in-laws, but we're not going to talk about that here. Now, uh, think about the modern marriage ceremony. What happens, Paul? I've got a picture of you in my office getting married. That's because I share an office with his mom. <laughs> and <laughs> so Paul, Paul is standing at the altar. He has stepped out from his family. He's waiting to receive his bride. And Joy Lynn's father marches her down. Or who walked you down the aisle? Because your dad did the marriage, didn't he? Yeah. Oh, so he walked, then he stayed up there, huh? Yeah, his dad did the beginning, and then my dad did. Oh, okay. Cool. So Joy Lynn's father, Joy Lynn was still under the covering of her father. Her father was still her leader until the moment that he took her hand and put it into Paul's hand and then Paul became her leader. There was a transference. It was like a changing of uh, command ceremony that you'd see in the Marine Corps. 
When they pass, they take the flag from the one commander, they hand it to the next commander. That happened at your marriage. It happened at all your marriages. You came under the covering of your husband at that moment in time. So, he's joined to his wife, they become one flesh, and then they multiply. The state and the church could not exist without family building blocks. Our church doesn't exist without families. We need families. Our government, our community, our city, it's, a, it's an amalgamation of families. We all cluster together, and then these governments pop up outside of our families. And so the family is the basic building block for all of creation, all of our organization. I just read that one earlier. The second point is the normal school in which subjection to law is first taught. So our families are a school in which our children learn to subject themselves to the law. Now, we as Christians are subjected to God's law, are we not? And when our children are born into our homes, they're subjected to our law and God's law. But this is where they learn from the very earliest age. Training begins early and it's applied constantly. That baby is not out of that mom's sight for the first year, I hope, <laughs> more than that maybe. You're constantly correcting, constantly training, constantly putting this child under your supervision. The harshness of authority is tempered with parental affection. So yes, you must obey me, I am your mother, but I love you. And so this makes this subjection uh, taste good to the child because the child wants to please his mother to get the hugs, right? The child wants to please their father because he loves them. Two complementary parties are vested with a joint jurisdiction. Okay, this is getting, you gotta read this stuff to really appreciate it. This is like our government, like the Senate and the House. In this case, we've got the husband and the wife working together as a joint complementary party that are vested with a joint jurisdiction over this household. You know, the husband's weak in certain areas. The wife can complement and add that strength. The wife's weak in other areas. The husband can complement and add that strength. You're working together to bring order to this household. That's what our families do. And that's what we see modeled in the form of government that we have. Next, the law is presented and illustrated continually. Ooh, I like this. Don't touch that. Put that down. The law is being constantly put before them. But... Um, the child, what he sees is that there's a hierarchy within the home. The wife submits to her husband and thereby exemplifies godly submission to the child. This child is going to learn how to submit himself to God because he's going to submit himself to mom who submits herself to the husband. This is all modeled right there. It's just these very basic building blocks that the child needs from a very early age in order to succeed later in life. So there's no better training for men for the duties of society and government than to be subject to the law. Could you imagine having a government? What kind of government would you need if none of the people under your jurisdiction would submit themselves to the law? Death squads, uh, military law, people coming around and, I mean, it would be absolute chaos. If not one person could submit themselves to another, it would be absolute chaos. But God has built it into our families to bring order and peace to our communities. It's just fascinating. Now, this, uh, here's, here's one of the things that I could never have written. Sweetened by an affection which renders service a privilege and duty a pleasure. Because we love our children and we have fun with them, and because they love us back, they love to submit themselves to us. They love to uh, serve us. It becomes a pleasure. And when they learn that early on, they're able to, to apply that to their workplace and be a successful employee and actually get ahead in life. They're able to apply that to their citizenship within the community. Duty and service become a privilege and an honor. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey and be ready for every good work. Titus 3.1. The last one is God illustrates, here it comes, God illustrates the fundamental principles for his universal moral government. Okay, I know this is getting deep and I promise to move on quickly. But this is the biggest problem. 
how do you reconcile two parties? How do you reconcile the, the free will of this person with the free will of this person to get them to work together? How do you bend your child's will to do your will, right? Moms, how do you get them just to make their bed in the morning? So this becomes a, a giant struggle within the house. Wills bending, and then you've got the husband-wife thing going on, right? Let alone the kids. But this is all happening, and it's all a pattern for God's universal moral government. Check this out. Okay, so we're going to try to figure out how to reconcile two parties. We bring the two separate wills into harmony and cooperation. The husband and wife work together. The parent and child work together. But also, you as the creation are bringing your will into the harmony of God's will. You as a child of God are learning to work with your Father in heaven. You learn the ability for that as a child in your own home as you're growing up. This is impossible unless you learn it as a child. And therefore, it's so important for us to model it at home and to help to encourage our kids to harmonize their wills with God's will. That's our whole purpose, right? If we can launch them out of our house in harmony with God, we've done a great work. Now, thank, thank God for Jesus that he died on the cross to take away the whole, all the barriers for that, right? And he sends his spirit to help us with that. Otherwise, it would be impossible. The supremacy of the law with its natural and necessary penalties. If you don't obey mama, what do you get? A whooping, right? <laughs> so, the child is punished for transgressing the law at home, so too the sinner must be punished for transgressing God's law. You and I are guilty. We have all broken God's law. And there is a penalty and a punishment for breaking God's law. Is there not? Just like there is in our home, so there is in heaven with God. But, and I'm happy about this, and I teach this to the kids, the preschoolers, as often as I can, when Jesus died on the cross, he was receiving the punishment of God on that cross. And all the punishment that we deserved has been meted out onto him and taken away from us. And Christ's righteousness has been accredited to our account. We've got this licked, but the child doesn't. <laughs> Not with your law, at least. And so they're learning what it means to, uh, to grieve a holy God by grieving their holy mother. They're learning what that means, and they're feeling the sinfulness, the guilt of their sin. They can understand it at a spiritual level because they understand it here at the physical level within the home. Now, what else have we got here? Subordination and dependence are universal. Uh, we see this in nature, right? Subordination, there's a food chain. The bear eats the salmon, which eats the littler fish, which eats the whatever it eats, and then mosquitoes, hopefully. <laughs> we also see dependence in the ecosystem, right? Without those trees, we're not breathing. Without that algae that grows on the ocean water, we're not breathing. We are dependent upon other parts of the ecosystem for our life. But the same thing is true in God's, in God's kingdom. We see it in our home with our children. Our children are subordinate to us, and they're also dependent upon us. And we ourselves are subordinate to God, and we are dependent upon God. God gave us our first breath this morning when we woke up, and Lord willing, he'll keep giving us those breaths for a long, a long time, right? But we are completely dependent upon him for that. Now, we see in nature, oops, sorry. Uh, let's see. Oh, man, we're going to see it when we're in heaven. Our subordination and dependence upon God. Check out this, Revelation 22, 5. There shall be no light there. They need no lamp nor light of the sun, for the Lord God gives them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. We will be in subject, we will be in subjection to God, and yet we will be ruling and reigning with him. I don't know how this is going to work out. I hope I get Hawaii as my territory. <laughs> but we are dependent on him for our very light in heaven. There's probably no need for food in heaven, although we got this wedding or this 
marriage supper waiting for us, but there's, he gives us everything we need when we're in heaven. He sustains the angels forever and ever, and he's going to sustain us forever and ever. Crazy. But we learn that first in the home. And then finally, an example of moving from a lower state to a higher state. Children start to grow up, right kids? <laughs> and they start as these little guys and they can't even get off the ground and then they start uh, crawling and then they start toddling and then they start running and then they're in the backyard with the trampoline and they understand that there's this progression in life. I started out as a little worm and now I am, I don't mean that in the evolution way. <laughs> as a little, uh, whatever, okay. And now, Look what I'm capable of. And then they're gonna grow up and they're gonna become parents themselves and the chain continues. And then they're, gonna get, then they're gonna be grandparents. I mean, so there's this progression that we see from a lower state to a higher state. As believers, we begin as children in our faith. When we first came to Christ, we didn't know nothing. All we knew is that we were guilty sinners and we needed help and God gave us that help. And then as we continued, that's called justification, right? Justification, just as if you've never sinned. God takes away your punishment on the cross, gives you the righteousness of Christ. You're going to heaven, but you're a baby in Christ. Sanctification is the process whereby you grow into the image of Christ. Christ's godly attributes start to become your own. And the flesh nature, which is taking up residence inside of you, gets pushed away and replaced by Christ's righteousness. Sanctification. So we're moving up, and then, oh, the day we die, thank God, because now glorification can happen. God finishes the transforming work. The body of flesh that carried that sin along through our entire life is left behind, and now he gives us a perfect body without sin, our glorified state. We can't understand the concept of starting as a baby Christian and moving to glorification unless we learn that in the home at the very beginning. Okay, I already read that verse. So now, let's get on to the intentional parenting, and we'll start going a little bit quicker. I hope that was okay. Are you guys into this? <laughs> I'm blown away. Like, the family's really cool when you read this stuff. So, intentional parenting. Intentional means it's done on purpose. It's deliberate. The world's way appears to be the default way. In fact, it's default by law. Here's why. If you don't have a plan for your family... The state is more than happy to come up to your house and take away your child and put them into the system, right? If you can't care for your child, the state will do it for you. We see this as being an automatic system, something that the world has put into place for their own benefit, not for ours. Preschool. Uh, mandatory pre preschool is coming down the pike, isn't it? Uh, people in... Uh, Hillary, I think, is a big proponent of that, is she not? Now, mandatory preschool comes with it, the promise that the government will pay for your preschool. And so those working families where the husband and the wife work rejoice because preschool is really expensive. Can I get an amen from somebody who's paying for preschool? <laughs> and then, um, only 30% of married couples that have kids in the home have a traditional structure whereby one father works and one mother stays at home to care for the children. Only 30% of our families today that have children have that kind of benefit in their family. My dad's a CFP, a certified financial planner. So he goes and he looks at people's finances all the time. And he took this couple, he worked in uh, Baltimore, so he gets a lot of government, federal government employees and the husband and wife are both working. And he goes through their whole budget, and he's laying it all out, and he sits down to talk to them and give them kind of the results and help them lay out a game plan for their personal finances. And he was able to prove to the family, if the wife just stopped working and stopped paying for dry cleaning and eating out and transportation costs and childcare costs and whatever else she was spending, if she would just stay at home with the child and actually raise her child, which is the desire of her heart, they would save money. Don't say it's not possible. It is possible. The only reason she had that job was to, I don't know, stroke her ego, 
give her, the world has some other calling other than motherhood. Motherhood isn't good enough. You have to go out and do something else. I'm not sure. That's between her and God. But my dad was able to prove financially that, hey, you want to take care of your child, it's doable. We can do this. The next thing is the kids are going to move up to public school, right? Now, now it is a law. As soon as your kid hits six years old by October, September, December, something like that, they must be enrolled in a school. Well, if you don't have any prior planning, that kid must go to a public school. And the truant officer is going to come by and pick them up and make sure they get delivered to school. With prior planning, you can go to a private school and pay out money. With prior planning, you can go to homeschool and work your buns off. With prior planning, there's so many options that are available. But the world has a default system. Next, you go to college, right? Then you get to just accumulate debt. <laughs> then you have a career. Then you get to try to pay off that debt. Then you start your childbearing years, and then you go back into debt again. <laughs> and then, of course, you hit retirement. You try to pay off that debt and pray that there's enough money left over at the end. This is the world system, and it keeps chugging us through. Intentional parents will stop, take a moment, think about it. What does God want for my family? What decisions do I have to make? Sometimes they might be hard decisions, but what do I need to do in order to ensure that my children will be raised in a way that will please the Lord? Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We can't be pushed into the world's mold. We as Christians serve a higher power than the federal government. We as Christians serve the Lord Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, a rewarder of those who are obedient, and a punisher of those who are disobedient. And we need to think about him first. If we renew our mind by reading and studying the scriptures, we will be able to determine what the perfect will of God is for our families and we'll be able to implement that. So now, there, that was that one. We need to run the race. What's hindering us from running the race? Hebrews 12, 1 says, Therefore we also, since we have surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, those are the angels in heaven, and all the saints that have preceded us to heaven, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. An intentional parent will do the hard thing, will run the race to the end. A professional athlete is completely intentional at every single level with their diet, their sleep patterns, where they, study, where they work out, who they're working out with, their coaching. Everything is leading them up to that goal. We as intentional parents need to have that same goal. What's our goal? What are we raising our kids for? We need to solidify that in our mind and then we need to run the race to make it happen. We'll talk more about that in a second. If there's anything that's hindering us, from par parenting our children in a biblical way, we need to cast it aside and get rid of it. It's just weighing us down. It's not helping us to run the race. Okay, so the world has a plan for your kids and the experts are waiting for them. How have the experts been doing in the last hundred years? Are our children getting better or worse? I'm talking about not your kids specifically. Your kids are angels. I'm talking about the world, uh, America's kids, right? They're lazier, they're entitled, they are filled with anger, they're suicidal, they are not succeeding in life. The experts have had our children long enough. You've turned your kids over to professionals and they've failed. Why? Because it's our job. God has ordained our family to do the hard work. Fathers, it's us. So. Let's have, uh, we already read that one. So we're going to look at four areas for intentional parenting. Number one, childbearing. Number two, our activities. Number three, our sacrifices. And number four, our discipline and training. And those go hand in hand. So let's talk about childbearing. So this is starting at the beginning, right? Can't have a family without some kids. <laughs> the world's trend right now is towards smaller families. Remember how I said... Western European countries, especially after World War II, have just plummeted in their birth rates. France, for instance, 
has a birth rate of, I think, 1.9, which means that France is decreasing in French population. The problem is they've got a big uh, population of legal immigrants, not illegal, legal immigrants that are coming from Northern Africa and the Middle East. These people are predominantly Muslim. They're having about six kids per family. So you tell me what's gonna happen in two to three generations in France. They will cease to be, not that they are a Christian nation, but they will cease to be a Western Christian nation and they will become a Muslim nation. They will become a nation under Islam. The rule of the Quran is just a few generations away in France because they are not replacing their population and yet the people that are coming in are. Now thank God when people get into a prosperity area like France and, and they see the things that are available, they start to slow down with their childbearing. And we'll talk about why in a second. So all is not lost, but we need to be evangelizing these people as they're coming in. Our churches in Germany are doing gangbuster work right now because all these Syrian refugees are coming into Germany and they're getting put in these crazy cities like my friend, uh, Pastor Gunther Weber, in Grunstadt, this little podunk city in the middle of nowhere, Germany, and all these Syrian refugees show up because the German government has to put them somewhere. They've been out there every week reaching out to these people. These are, these are new Christians just waiting to hatch, right? And so the church in Germany is, for the first time, looking way outside of themselves and seeing this huge influx and saying, this is our job. We're going to go meet that. If you guys go up to the hut, the newest edition of uh, Calvary Chapel Magazine has a big feature story on what the German church is doing there with their kids, or with the refugees. So, our command is to be fruitful and multiply. Oh, let me talk about this, the smaller families. There's a proverb that speaks to this. A man who isolates himself seeks his own desire. He rages against all wise judgment. I think that's in some way, especially in the modern world, that's what we're seeing. There's this inward focus. And people are trying to feed themselves and their own desires and they don't see kids as fitting into that mold. I need to be able to take my vacations unhindered. I need more money for my BMW or whatever. I need to do this, I need to do that. Kids are not factoring into this whole argument and that's why we're seeing the population rate go down. But that's just my opinion. So, should a Christian couple have kids? The answer to that is absolutely. Why? Because it was commanded by God. It was the first instruction given to man in the Bible. It happens in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. Then God blessed them and God said, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Having children is a con natural consequence of marital intimacy, is it not? And that's as deep as I'm going to go because there's a lot of kids in the room. <laughs> but you guys know, God made it pleasurable because of the, I, I honestly believe this, God made it pleasurable because of the selfishness in our hearts. If it wasn't a pleasure, we wouldn't be doing it as much as we do it. Thank God in his foresight that he made it pleasurable so that we could get beyond our selfish selves and have this natural consequence which ends up being the greatest blessing in our life. Children have always historically been seen as a blessing. It's only in the modern world that they're being mocked or that people are deciding, I'm gonna be married but I'm not gonna have any kids, I'm just gonna be, have this empty house and just me and my wife and we're gonna do our thing. Children have always been a blessing. Why has, this been, why has this been changing? It fulfills our calling. Men, you and I were called to be fathers. I would venture as far to say that you and I cannot truly understand the gospel until we are fathers. It happened to me one night when I don't know who was sick. One of these guys was sick. And I walked in and I just had this feeling in my heart. I would do anything to take away their illness and their suffering and put it on myself so that they can be relieved of this. Literally, I would take the fever, I would go to the hospital, I would get the shots, I would do whatever it takes. Don't you know that's God's heart for us? He sees us stuck in this sin. He sees us floundering around in life, and he says, I would do anything to help these guys out. 
In fact, he did, right? He sent his one and only son to do that for us. The father heart of God. We can't understand that until we have kids. Moms, you know this fulfills a deep desire in your heart. To look down into the eyes of your baby and to see her looking up at you, that is something that I, as a father, don't connect with. <laughs> and that's okay, because I connect with other stuff. But my wife, boy, she loves babies. And I know you do too. And it fulfills the deepest desire that God has put into you to put those babies into your arms. Especially when it's yours, it's even better, right? Any other baby, like, well, that's kind of ugly. <laughs> but your baby is the most beautiful baby there is. Okay, we read that one. So childbearing. Oh, we got more. Of course, because it's important. Here we go. Continued. Ooh, provides life-changing sanctification and growth. I have seen this man, Scott Dupar, change so much now that he has four kids. <laughs> this guy was a wild man, right? Think about how much you've changed. His pastoring, I mean, seriously. I'm sure the police department and the fire department went on call whenever the junior hires were out and about before he had kids. And now that he has kids, it has changed him. He is sanctified. He is grown. Kids still get hurt, but whatever. <laughs> Number two, fill that quiver. Uh, I don't even know where I am in my notes here. Fill that quiver. Okay. We'll talk, there's a verse at the end that we'll talk about filling the quiver. Do you need more kids? Adoption. I'm telling you what, guys, God says, blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. If you look at the Hebrew word that was used full of them, it means filling. There's this intentionality about it, okay? If you want to be blessed by God, fill your quiver. Get to work. If you need me to help you along with the, draw some diagrams or talk it through, we can get it. But what if you're incapable? What if that time has passed? What if you say, look, no more biological kids. I'm going to go rescue some kids. We've got amazing families in this church that are doing that. Aaron and Emily Austin, Aaron got up on, um, on Orphan Sunday, maybe last one or maybe two ago, and he says, I thought my family was done. I had three kids, Rhett Ryler and Avery, and I thought, we're done, this is it, everything. And then they fostered Sadie, and Sadie came into their life. And he stood up before the congregation and he cried and he says, I didn't know it, but my family was not complete. I tell you what, guys, if God has blessed you with a minivan and more than two bedrooms at home, maybe your family's not complete. I know mine's not. Sabine and I have been praying about this a lot. If we don't have any more biological kids, we're going to go rescue some. It's the greatest act of human redemption that we can do. To go and find a child which is abandoned or unloved, and to rescue them and to give them a home and all of the benefits that come from knowing the Lord in a Christian home. It enriches, it enriches your family, too, because your biological kids get affected by that. We have friends, the Swaneys. They adopted a young man from Uganda. So here's this white Irish family with red hair all the way through, and here's Adam. <laughs> and he's... Uh, doesn't have red hair. <laughs> but I tell you what, their family is amazing to see these guys work together. They've got seven kids now. Adam was, you know, Adam was added in the middle. But anyways, the kids will benefit from it too. Now, why did God give you these kids? Why do I have these kids? I know you've yelled it out, right? Why are these, what are you doing to me? Remember, those kids were knit together in your womb. God knew their days before there was yet one. God has ordained every day of their life, and God said, no, those kids are going to go to Michael and Shannon because you needed Amelia, right? She was yours, and only you can bring to her life what God has for her. She's not going to go anywhere else for that. Every single one of your kids, guys, was brought into your life for a special reason. 
And that is a precious gift that we have to foster and hold close and bring up. Okay. Oh, and the challenges that you're facing, only you can face those challenges with your kids. It's not easy, is it? There's trials, there's tribulations, some are special needs. But God said, no, these are the people that are going to deal with it, this mom and this dad. Now, behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has his quiver full of them. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, deaths lately. There's been a lot of funeral services and stuff around the church. And there's nothing sadder than uh, a man or a woman that, that doesn't leave many kids behind. Very few people attend their services. There's not much legacy being left. There's no heritage. But when you have a big family, oh man, watch out. You fill the room. Your life has been a celebration and you've impacted literally the world through that. Activities. There's your, there's your minivan moms. Taxi drivers. I'm going to talk about intentional parenting with filling up your child's day. There may be things that you were doing which you may not have thought all the way through. I want to encourage you at this time to think about all the things that your kids are doing. Maybe you have to make a list and do some pros and cons. Maybe you have to pray about some of these things. Are these activities helping your children to grow in the training and mission of the Lord, admonition, or are they hindering that godly pursuit in your families? We're exhorted to lead a quiet life. The Bible's very clear about that. 1 Thessalonians 4.11. You should aspire to lead a quiet life. Mind your own business and to work with your own hands as we commanded you. Proverbs 17.1 says, Better is a dry morsel with quietness than a house full of feasting with strife. And then 1 Timothy 2.1 says, Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayer, and intercessions, and giving of thanks be made to all men, for kings and for all who are in, in authority, moms and dads are in authority, so we'll pray for you too, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. The most godly people you know are probably not the ones running around like chickens with their heads cut off. They're probably the people that can take time to be with their Lord. We, and I struggle with this, trust me, because we're running around crazy too. We need to sit down and we need to model for our kids what it means to pursue the Lord and to take time to do that, and we need to help them to do it too. So that when they grow up, they won't depart from that path. They need it as much as we do. And trust me, the speed of life is ever increasing. Uh, I don't know where I talk. Oh, here it is. Life is accelerating for our, even our younger ones. Think about what your kids are doing at a young age. I remember, man, homework really didn't start for me until I got to high school, honestly. I mean, junior high, there was some, maybe 30 minutes, right? It's usually math sheets. But real homework didn't start for me until high school. How many of your elementary school kids are coming home with hours of homework? As a homeschooler, I'm like, well, what's happening at the school? Why aren't they doing it there? It only takes me th two hours to finish our schoolwork and the homework. Why do we have to bring home two hours worth of work? That's, that's a big issue. Life is accelerating for our younger ones. The world that they're growing up into is getting crazy and crazier. Okay, got to have a David Guzik quote. This is from his commentary on uh, 1 Timothy 2. We need to live a quiet life so that we can really take the time and give the attention to listen to God. When we live a quiet life, we can listen to God and get to know him better. And then I've got to skip the Matthew Henry quote because we're running out of time. But if you like Matthew Henry, I've got a good one here. In our house, what we're doing to foster quiet time is that when our littlest ones take naps, and even Sabina sneaks in a nap during this time, the older ones go into the living room and they're given three things to do. Sit down and read a book, pray, or take a nap themselves. We're forcing them to have one hour, a solid hour, of just quiet within our house. 
That's what we're trying to do to foster that. We just added a dog to our family. She might even bark because she's just on the other side of that wall. We added a dog to our family. This has slowed us down immensely. A puppy, oh my, we can't go anywhere and do anything now because no, who's going to watch this puppy? It's out of control. No, it's a good dog. But I thank God for that puppy now. We're doing things we never did because God has slowed us down. Children are going to slow you down. I remember the first time going to Costco with, with Jana in the car seat and we had a blowout diaper. And I'm just like, I just want to go in and get the shopping done. And then you realize it takes you 15 minutes to get the stroller out, and then you got to do a clothing change, and then you get it all buckled together. Jason and Katie, it was taking you forever to get Wednesday night at the beach. What were you doing? They've got one baby. You know? Rachel's like, and four kids, she's got them trained. Another thing. I know it's good, and David Guzik might fire me for saying this, but you don't have to be at every church function. Church functions are great, but if your family needs to slow down, it's okay to stay home and slow down. The Lord's at your house too. He's not just here. It's okay not to go to every church function. I want you guys, quiet time, you don't have to do everything. That was the thing, right? Your family is the Lord's work. Those of you who get caught up serving the Lord, know this, that God's going to hold you accountable first for what you did with your family, and second, what you did with your ministry. If you need to slow down in your time that you're using to serve the Lord, to concentrate on your family, by all means do it. And trust me, as pastors and working here, man, if we're, on, if we're here to get fed on a Wednesday night, it doesn't happen. We're here to work, right? Even if we're here trying to chill, that doesn't happen for us. So we need to make sure, especially that we set that time aside. But you guys need to do that too. Okay. Therefore, I, uh, yeah, we already read that one. Sacrifice. See the guy there? He's got a pocket with no money in it. <laughs> so let's start with the parents and sacrifice. Intentional parenting will have a financial sacrifice. It might be, honey, you're not going to go to work. You're going to stay home with the kids. That is a significant financial sacrifice. But I would venture to say it's one worth taking, and the Lord can and will provide for you. It may not be in Santa Barbara. I know that's like anathema to even say that. It may not be in Santa Barbara. You might have to physically up and move in order to accomplish what's best for your family. But God can and will provide. And by God's grace, we're still here. Scott's still here. Daniel's still here. I know what these guys make, and I don't know how they're still here. So I know God's providing for them. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. But once again, if we walk out in obedience to God's word, he'll bless it. You might have to sacrifice a clean house. <laughs> Scott's laughing. He's been to my house. I've been to his house. <laughs> Guys, <laughs> okay, we'll leave that there. <laughs> I've got a verse. I've got to read the verse. Proverbs 14, 4, where no oxen are, the trough is clear, but much increase comes by the strength of an ox. Where no children are, the house is clean, right? <laughs> Your hobbies and interests, golfing, whatever it is, might have to get put on hold for a while so that you can focus on your family and doing its right. That's what we call me time, right? Shopping. You might even have to sacrifice certain things at mealtime. Our family now, by God's grace, we're reading through the one-year Bible as a family. And so every mealtime I read uh, the, from the one-year Bible. And it extends our mealtime, and we have behavioral issues that we have to deal with at the table to do that, and it's hard work, and everybody wants to get on, but that's what we're doing. And that's a sacrifice. But it's a sacrifice I know God is going to honor. Uh, there's the meal times. Uh, you can't go out to eat as much when you got kids, right? <laughs> Certainly not the nice restaurants. Not until they get trained. And I'm scared. Not scared. I'm scared in a good way, maybe. It's a healthy fear. We're going to Germany uh, in two days. And Sabina's uh, sister married a guy who owns going on six fine dining restaurants in Frankfurt. 
And so no doubt we will be going to very, lots of very nice restaurants. And so you want to increase your prayer life? Take your kids to nice restaurants. <laughs> By God's grace, I don't have to pay for it, too. Oh, my. Screen time. Okay, this is a big one. What are you, what are you bringing into your house? Screen time. TV's always on. Internet is unfiltered. You bought your kids the smartphone. You pay for the monthly data plan, and then you're shocked they're not spending more time with the family. Guys, think about what you're doing with your screen time at home. This is a way to foster quietness in our home, and this is a way we might have to sacrifice it for ourselves because we love watching our shows, but we might have to sacrifice it for the kids. Um, oh, this is the worst, and God's working me on this, but are you one of those parents that the kids always catch you on your phone? I'm going to stop right there. It's too convicting. I can't even talk about it. Okay. What will a profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Be willing to sacrifice for your kids. The kids can sacrifice too. In fact, they should sacrifice. It's godly. Are you modeling it for them, right? You're modeling it for them, right? You're sacrificing. They see that. You should help them to sacrifice too. Giving up a sport or activity for a season. Families, especially with families with multiple kids, if you've got this one in hockey and that one in soccer and this one in baseball and that one in water polo and you don't even see each other throughout the week, something has to change. Something has to change. Your family is not together. Maybe a child has to sacrifice a sport for a season. Maybe, hey, it's Timmy's turn to play soccer this season. We're all as a family going to go and be at the games and root for him. Think about what that does for the kids. All my brothers and sisters are screaming for me. And trust me, you'll have the biggest cheering section because everybody else is just a mom sitting there on her phone, right? <laughs> Sad but true. Guys, the kids, they can do it. Sharing a room. Oh, heaven forbid our kids have to share a room. Um, it's very interesting that the, uh, that the state in the fostering program forces you to segregate boys in one room and girls in the other, and they must stay segregated and they can't be mixed. I mean, for thousands of years, everybody lived in one room, right? The Bible even said, the guy's knocking on the door and eating bread, and he's like, I'm in bed with my kids, right? There was one bed, one common room. And so sharing a room could, can only help them. They're gonna get it all out, right? Get it out of their system, the fist fights, the <laughs> cursing, whatever it's gonna be. It will prepare them for the future. Sitting still, yes, sometimes they have to sacrifice their time and just sit there and be quiet. And you can train your kids to do this. This is one thing that Scott sees our kids do. I'll show you guys what the secret is. They're called ring pops. We made a, we made a, a commitment in our family that our kids, uh, we, do, we do two services, right? We do first and second service every single week. And we've been doing that ever since before these kids were born, so they've never known any different. And now they're like, wait, people only do one service? Look at them. They've got shock and dismay on their face. <laughs> so we said, no, we're going to use this as a training time to sit them down and to sit through a sermon. They might even catch something from David Guzik, and you'd be surprised what these kids pick up from David Guzik. But uh, it takes a little of encouragement, and these have 11 grams of sugar, and that's almost one-third of what one eight-ounce cup of apple juice has. So those parents would be like, oh, it's going to rot your teeth. I know, Dr. Carly. <laughs> I know, Dr. Carly. But trust me, it is a great tool, and it helps them to concentrate, and it's, it's biblical. They're going to get new teeth anyways, right? That's right. They're going to get new teeth. <laughs> Serving together. So my kids sit with me front row, side, right side there, right? My kids sit with me first service, second service, they're in with us in the two and three-year-old room. They are serving with mom and dad. They're helping us to, I mean, it's like herding cats, you know how that is, right? Imagine a whole room, like sometimes it's over 20 two and three-year-olds. You're smiling because your daughter's there, but she's a good one. She, she keeps to herself, doesn't bite too many kids. It's herding cats, but we're doing as a family. They've never known any different. And I want them to see that, hey, mom and dad are willing to sacrifice their afternoon because we could go off and have brunch somewhere, but we're here to serve the Lord. 
and they're going to do it together with us. And then finally, compassion children. We're making a financial sacrifice to support four children around the world that don't have the resources to get a Christian education or to even get the health care and uh, one meal a day that they might otherwise not get. And our kids know the names of those kids. We pray for them daily. Those kids know the pictures because we have them hanging up. Those kids write letters to them, draw pictures, send stickers. There's a connection there that they're not going to get anywhere else. We as parents, we need to do that. Okay. There's Abraham tying up Isaac. He's going to sacrifice him on whose altar? God's altar, right? Jehovah God, that's his altar. What are we sacrificing our children on? What's our altar to? Are we convinced that what's best for our children is to go to USC? If so, we're going to sacrifice them on the altar of USC. Are we convinced that our children should be doing sports because it helps to develop their character? If it's affecting their godly character building, you're sacrificing them on the altar of sports. What else is up there? Academics, right? If their godly character isn't anywhere but they're a straight-A student, God doesn't care. He wants to see godly character on the inside. What are we sacrificing our children on? Discipline. <laughs> this hurts me more than it hurts you? No, it actually hurts my kids more. <laughs> and at Scott Dupar's house, that spoon has a happy face and is called Mr. Happy. Okay. Discipline is how we bless our children. Fathers, this is our responsibility. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. That's the blessing. If our children will honor their mother and father, it will go well with them. If they can do it in the home, they can do it in their workplace. If they can do it in their workplace, they can do it in their church. If they can do it in their church, they can do it in their community. But fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Everybody focuses on the first part. Don't bring them up, don't provoke them to wrath, don't provoke them to wrath, that's okay. But it's our responsibility to train them also. Asking forgiveness and receiving forgiveness. I've got a lot of books back there that talk about discipline. And the biggest thing that we've done for our family that's helped, and this is like my tip for the day for discipline, is when uh, something happens and discipline needs to be meted out, and in our house it's a spank and it's with this hand because that's my power meter. I know exactly how hard I'm hitting them. And uh, we'll spank, they'll turn around, they have to ask forgiveness for that specific sin. Please forgive me for whatever. Then I say, I forgive you. Those words have to come out. Please forgive me, I forgive you. Then there's reconciliation, which is a hug. Then there's usually a prayer afterwards. And guess what happens after that? Are grudges held? Are people sulking in the corner? Are you in the other room fuming and just storing up this anger waiting to explode? No, you get it out there, you deal with it, you move on with life. And it works amazingly well. My children just move on. I love it. Thank you, kids. <laughs> we never can discipline in anger. It's the worst. I've got so many verses on disciplining and anger, and I can only get to one. A quick-tempered man acts foolishly, but a wicked man, but a man of wicked intentions is hated. Do you want your kids to hate you? Discipline and anger. There's nothing worse that we can do. It breaks the relationship between uh, parent and child, and uh, it has a lot of consequences. And it breeds anger in our children, and then we have to deal with that later. That's a big one. I've got a whole book back there on that. We have to present a united front. Husbands and wives need to be agreed. This is disciplinable, this isn't. This is how we discipline, this is not how we discipline. You have to work together, come up with a plan, and then work it. And there's that promise. Training, you have to have training with the discipline. It's like, uh, it's like uh, this guy, this bodybuilder here. You see him, he's got the huge arms. And then he's got his son there with the little tiny arms. That guy has to diet in order to, to look like that, right? He's got to eat very lean, high-protein meals. 
but he's not going to gain any muscle mass unless he does the heavy lifting. The discipline is like the diet. I strip it away. The training is like the heavy lifting. We're teaching our kids what to do. It's not enough to punish them for doing something wrong. We have to teach them what to do. It's natural for us to pass along our wisdom. The entire book of Proverbs, starting from Proverbs chapter 1, verse 1, says, I'm writing this to my son. Solomon was writing it to his son. Proverbs 31, when it ends, King uh, Lemuel, right? That was his mother writing to him, Proverbs 31. We need to train anywhere and anytime. That's what they call in the milieu, which is a French word for like anywhere and anytime. Uh, can't have one without the other. This is hand-to-hand -hand with discipline. There's many more resources on this topic that we have back at our table. So these are resources we love, and this finishes it for us. Um, if you've got preschoolers, we love this Bible. This Lois Rock, my very first Bible. Uh, we've got it back there if you want to take it. These are all our books. These aren't the free books that you guys can take. <laughs> but if you want to buy one for 50 bucks, they're $50 each. <laughs> we love this Bible. If you get this for your kids, my kids have this thing. What's the opening prayer? We don't have time. But they've got it memorized. Quiz them after. We're moving up the chain here, okay? We've got uh, toddlers and young adolescents. The Catherine Voss, My Ch uh, Children's Story Bible, so well written. How do you explain these stories in words that a kid can understand? She does an excellent job of doing it. My storytelling with your preschoolers has benefited so much from reading this woman's book. And I read this woman's book and I learn things. I go, wait a second, it doesn't say that. And I go look it up, oh, it does. <laughs> Leading little ones to God. This is a way to describe theological realities to kids in a way that they'll understand. Sanctification, glorification, right? Right Choices by Kenneth Taylor. These are little short little stories that put kids into situations and they have to make the right choice out of it. Jesus Loves Me. These are lullabies and prayers written so beautifully. Sabina loves this one. That's a bedtime book for us. Christian Mother Goose. Have you read some of these nursery rhymes? Like the original versions? They're awful. <laughs> People are dying and getting things cut off. She puts a really nice spin, and she has a great CD that goes with it, too. That's a fun one. There's the one-year Bible. That's what we're reading as a family. Don't make me count to three. This is what helped to shape our um, asking forgiveness and receiving it and doing it right away. Uh, shepherding a Child's Heart has already been handed out. A fantastic resource. He's got one called uh, Instructing a Child's Heart, which talks about training. Teach Them Diligently is Lou Priolo. Uh, this is using the scriptures to, to train your child. He also does one called The Heart of Anger. If you've got a child that's dealing with anger issues, that would be a, the resource for you. And then Hints on Child Training, H. Clay Trumbull. You've heard of Elizabeth Elliot, the missionary uh, whose husband Jim Elliot died in Ecuador in the 1950s. She went on to get married two more times. All of her husbands died, which is biblical. <laughs> and she remarried. And did she recently pass away? Yeah. I think she did. Anyways, this is her grandfather. This is written in some pretty amazing language. And sometimes you have to do a cultural fast forward on what he talks about. But I hit this one and it slaps me across both cheeks because the stuff he talks about is amazing in, in terms of intentional parenting. And this is my parting verse for you. Don't lay up yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and their thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You can't take your money to heaven. You can't take your IRA to heaven. You can't take your Porsche to heaven. The only thing, you, sorry James, the only thing that you're gonna be able to take to heaven are people. And God has entrusted you with little people in your lives. And God forbid if you don't take those children to heaven. Do everything within your power. Be intentional with your parenting. Take those children to heaven. Lay them up there for later and you'll be rewarded when you get there. Because where your treasure is there your heart will be also. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for this time and I thank you for everybody's kind attention as you've given me so much to talk about this morning. But we ask, Lord, that you would take your word, sink it deep into our hearts. Father, help us to make the hard decisions that we need to make in order to make the best decisions for our family. 
We know, Lord, that by your Spirit, you're guiding and leading us through that. You promise to help us. We have so many resources at this church, both in pastors and in godly examples of families that have done it, been there, done that. Help us to get hooked up with the right people if we need help. Help us to spend time daily in your word and help us to be intentional as we parent. We want to take our kids to heaven, Lord. We want to carry on a heritage. We want our children's children to go to heaven. Help it to start right here, right today. In Jesus' name.